A quick Google search will reveal that there are so many methods that will allegedly improve your memory, from meditation to fish oil supplements to brain training. In this lesson, we're going to look at a few evidence-based techniques that have shown to help either at the encoding or recall phase. But first, let's rewind the clock a little back through my previous videos all the way to the moment I first told you about short-term memory. So previously in psychology, we saw that short-term memory has a couple of limits. Firstly, it only has a duration of about 12 to 30 seconds. And secondly, it only has a capacity of about five to nine pieces of information. But there are a few ways we can overcome this. Allow me to demonstrate. I'm about to show you 12 numbers, which is way out of the range of normal short-term memory, but try your best to see if you can remember it. Eight, seven, three, seven, one, six, zero, three, four, eight, seven, two. One more time. Eight, seven, three, seven, one, six, zero, three, four, eight, seven, two. Okay, let's enjoy this little picture of a dog with proper safety equipment on, but not for too long because we don't want it to leak a short-term memory. What were those 12 numbers? Try saying them. Now you might have done pretty well, or maybe quite terribly, but let's try that again a little bit differently. Here are 12 numbers, but this time I'm gonna break them up into five groups. See how you go remembering these. 28, 44, 1957, 12, 03. One more time. 28, 44, 1957, 12, 03. Once again, a little doggo trying to, I don't know, be a superhero of some sort. But back to those numbers. See if you can say them out. Well, how did you go this time? Chances are you did a little better. And that's because you did something called chunking. So chunking is the process of grouping items together in order to improve memory capacity. It's a way of overcoming the limit of that five to nine pieces of memory by creating groups that occupy each of those spaces instead of individual items. In this sense, chunking can even help with encoding into long-term memory as well. Chunking works really well with numbers, as we saw, and even more so if the numbers have their own meaning. I personally found those numbers quite easy to remember because, well, 1957 is like a year. Um, 1203 is today's date that I'm recording this, the 12th of March, uh, and 2844 is my PIN number. Just kidding. Uh, I would never trust you with that. Okay, so that's a way of overcoming the five to nine pieces capacity limit. But there is a second problem with short-term memory, which is that it's, well, short. It's also highly subject to interference, as we saw in an earlier video. But there's a really simple way of overcoming that, which is by taking the information and rehearsing it. In the movie Finding Nemo, when Dory randomly remembers a useful piece of information, she repeats it over and over in order to keep it in her memory. And possibly because she was just really proud of herself too. What did the mask say? P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. <gasps> what it said. I usually forget things, but I remembered it that time. P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. I remembered it again! Repeating P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney over and over is a form of maintenance rehearsal. Repeating it again and again so it doesn't go out of short-term memory. In fact, for people without memory loss, unlike Dory, maintenance rehearsal can even cause the information to be transferred into long-term memory. But there is a much more effective way of getting it into long-term memory. That's by using elaborative rehearsal. So that's when you rehearse the information, but this time you link it to other information you already know. It can be a bit tricky to get the difference between these two. So let me extend this analogy a little bit more using Dory's piece of information. Maintenance rehearsal, like mentioned before, is just repeating the same thing over and over and over so it stays in short-term memory. Elaborative rehearsal might look something like this. In order to remember that address, you might think, hey, I've got a friend called Sherman who lives in Newcastle, which is close to Sydney. Also, my address is 14 Clover Way. So I would just need to change the clover into a wallaby, you know, walk down the street a little bit on the same side of the street until I reach the number 42 and so on and so forth, rehearsing this information, but as you can see in a meaningful way. So linking new information with pre-existing things that you know. Of course, you can rehearse the information using a mixture of both, which would perhaps be even more effective. Another way of improving memory is by using mnemonics with a silent M. There are many examples of mnemonics such as visualization, rhythm and rhyme, but we're just gonna be focusing on two. Starting with the method of loci 
or if you're American, loci. So this is a mnemonic that uses spatial memory to aid in quickly recalling information. It's also got a few other names like memory palace, journey method, or Roman rooms. The method of loci was popularized by the BBC series Sherlock, a character who was able to remember essentially everything he'd ever seen because he was continually placing things into his mind palace. The principle here is that our memory of locations and visual information is much stronger than simply remembering lists of words. So how does it work? Well, first you start with a series of locations that you're very familiar with, for example, your home. You also need to have a set path through that place. So for example, starting in the kitchen, going to the dining room, across to the living room, and finally into your parents' room. Okay, with that in place, let's use the method of loci to try and remember something useful like a shopping list. Memorizing these seven items might be possible for the short term, but unless your shopping trip's gonna be done in 15 to 30 seconds, you want it to go into long-term memory. All right, let's begin the journey. So in the kitchen, we're gonna visualize an egg that's just been like splat on the ground. It's graphic, it's a little random, and that means it's gonna be easier to remember later. We walk past that broken egg into the dining room where we see bread on the table. That's a pretty easy one to remember. So we're gonna stick a jar of Vegemite on top of that as well. We turn right to continue our journey where we see that someone's placed a bunch of bananas right there on the floor, blocking our way. Irritating, but oh well. In the living room, we see that someone's placed bottles of soap everywhere also of different sizes. <laughs> Very random, but again, this is really good for our visual memory. And then finally, into our parents' room where we see a giant tub of ice cream on the bed, as you do, with a $20 gift card that someone shoved into the ice cream. How inconsiderate. Okay, you got that? Great. Off to the shops we go. Here we are, well, a few hours later perhaps, going around doing your thing. What are the seven items that you were meant to buy? Now, that wasn't actually the layout of your house, so it might be hard to remember, so I'll walk you through it. Starting in the kitchen, what was on the floor again? And then you walked out to the dining room and you saw something on the table. Two items, actually. Moving across to the living room, there was something annoying that someone had placed on the ground. And then there was this thing all over the living room. And finally, walking to your parents' bedroom, and there were two things there as well. How did you go? Hopefully using the method of loci, you were able to remember all of these things and maybe you could even have seen how you could have extended this to maybe twice, even thrice the length. The method of loci is such a simple and humble technique and yet it's literally the same one used to memorize world record breaking feats, such as reciting 100,000 digits of pi, which was done by Akira Haraguchi in 2006. And the final type of memory improvement technique that we're gonna be looking at today, the second type of mnemonic strategy, is the SQ4R method, which stands for survey, question, read, recite, relate, and review. It's essentially a guide on how to study well. The thinking here is that if all you did was just casually read through the text, you might get it at the time, but not a lot will be remembered in the long term. Doing these six steps will greatly increase your chance of retrieving this information in the future. Here's a summary of how it works. So step number one is to survey. That's quickly scanning through the text to get an idea of what's gonna be addressed, looking at headings, captions, and pictures. Step number two is asking a question, asking yourself what this text is about. Even better if you asked a question for each heading. Step number three is to actually then read the text with the questions in mind that you developed previously, answering it as you go along. Step four is to recite. So that's going through the text in your head or out loud and going through answers to your questions. In the next step, you relate. So that's linking what you just read to things that you already know. This can take time, but forming relationships between your existing knowledge and new knowledge greatly increases the chance you'll remember it. It's a bit similar to elaborative rehearsal like we looked at before. And finally, review. So this is refreshing your memory. This can be done immediately after the last five steps or periodically through the year, for example, if, I don't know, you've got a big exam you're preparing for. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So those are just some tips for improving memory. Get to know them, but maybe more importantly, use them. Remember, your long-term memory is theoretically infinite, so the sky isn't even the limit. All the best.